Run, 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 D, M, C! Except for the people who literally invented rapping in the 70s, there may be no hip hop act more influential than Run DMC. Take a count. One, two, three. Jam Master J. Run DMC. When Joseph Run Simmons, Daryl DMC McDaniels, and their DJ Jam Master J started making music together in the early 80s, they launched a music revolution. <laughs> They were hip hop's first everything. Hip hop's first superstars. First on MTV. First on the cover of Rolling Stone. First rap act with top 10 hits. First rap act with a gold album. First with a platinum album. First with a multi platinum album. Run DMC were not an old school hip hop act. They invented the new school. Back when hip hop was just a bunch of DJs telling you to throw your hands in the air. Run DMC redirected the entire course of hip hop with hard, minimalist beats and aggressive rhymes. Just the basic act of bragging about how good you are at rapping was something they introduced to the world. And with their duet of Walk This Way with Aerosmith, they brought hip hop to white America and brought it to new heights. It is impossible to overestimate what they did for rap music, which is to say, for all culture everywhere. But music of all genres can be unkind to its originators. Right after Run DMC peaked in 1986, hip hop began another rapid change. With the rise of Rakim, KRS-One, and Public Enemy, rap flows started to become a lot more complex. And though Run DMC would do their best to keep up, the 90s were not kind to them. They had a dramatically failed attempt to get with New Jack Swing at the start of the decade, which made them look just absolutely ridiculous. Was there ever a band less suited to bright colors than Run DMC? It's like seeing Johnny Cash dressed like Harry Styles. They did have a respectable return to form in 1993, but business problems at their label would keep them from following it up. In the meantime, hip hop just kept evolving. And after G-Funk, Wu-Tang, Illmatic, Tupac and Biggie, the styles represented by Run DMC felt more and more like yesterday's news. But as the 90s came to a close, the pendulum started swinging back their way. I'm the king of rock, the is not high, sucker MCs should call me sire. In the late 90s, a new kind of music started conquering the charts, rap metal. And basically every major artist in that genre cited the rhymes and hard rock beats of Run DMC as a main inspiration. All of a sudden, Run DMC were cool again. A house remix of one of their old songs became a big dance hit. They were in commercials, on the NBA, they were on MTV again. And as their label at last finished their acquisition by Arista Records, Run DMC was poised to cement their legacy with their newly announced, star-studded upcoming album, Crown Royal. When asked who's the best, y'all should say Run DMC and Jam Master J, and they were gonna make that happen with one of the hottest albums of 1999. Of the year 2000. Of the year 2001. Okay, it was not the smoothest recording in history. It's tricky to rock a rhyme that's right on time. But after much hype and infinite delays, the album finally arrived in early 2001 and Run DMC were ready to reclaim their throne and once again become the kings of rock. It goes a one, two, three, hit it! What? Is that the guy from Third Eye Blind? The semi-charmed life guy? That's the rock guy you brought to bring you in touch with new metal? Even got chrome on my microphone. D, are you are you just gonna stand there? Say something. Say something! I ain't stupid, y'all outrageous. Acting like run can't rock all ages. So don't act like y'all don't know. Guys, you must be illin'. Run DMC tries to get with new metal and just make sucker MCs of themselves. This is Train Records. Hey, this is a rock and roll museum.
You guys don't belong in here. <laughs> I'm the king of rock. There is none higher. So in 1985, at the beginning of their video for King of Rock, Run DMC are denied entry to a rock and roll museum, and they storm their way in anyway. A few years later, that rock and roll museum would exist in real life, and eventually Run DMC would be admitted as inductees. But by that point, it didn't feel like they had forced the rock establishment to accept them so much as rock and roll had co-opted them. In reality, they were always a little conflicted about appealing to the rock crowd and whether or not crossing over to the white audience was selling out. It's well known at this point how little they were interested in recording Walk This Way. They had to be talked into it. This is a conflict that would write itself large over the course of the recording of Crown Royal, which was torn apart by three different visions over what the album should be, resulting in a debacle that became infamous for seemingly unending delays. Like, here's a big article I found hyping the upcoming album in March of 2000, a good 13 months before it would finally hit stores. But as our story begins, things are looking up because they had big names on their side. The man behind the music, Mr. Clive Davis. Joining with Arista Records meant joining up with music industry titan Clive Davis, who at the time was on some kind of mission to resurrect everyone's career. He did amazing things for Santana that year. He also did pretty well working a comeback for Whitney Houston. He was not able to do much for the artist formerly and in the future known as Prince. But still, if he could rack up Grammys for 52-year-old Carlos Santana, imagine what he could do for Run DMC. Again, this was at the height of rap rock, which wouldn't exist without them. They had the respect. The wind was at their sails. The entire reason Clive Davis bought their label was so he could have a new Run DMC album. This was great news for Run, who was always trying to keep the band relevant. In fact, Run had already started working on the album before the sale went through, just to help push it over the line. Pretty quickly, he came out with the album's first song, just a little teaser track that leaked to radio stations. And in it, you can see Run's vision for the album pretty clearly. Bounce with me, bounce with me. Can I get a wop, wop, can you Okay, so over the years, Run became obsessed with keeping up with the new trends. At the time, he was way into the hot new superstar, Jay-Z. So for this record, Run was jocking Jay-Z style and his producers all over the place. You can, you can hear Hard Knock era Jay all over this record. Anyway, this is the first little taste of the record, a track called The Beginning, which is just tempting fate, right, Black Eyed Peas? The beginning, parentheses, no further delay, a title which will only get funnier and funnier over the next three years. By the time the album finally comes out, this song will be retitled Simmons Incorporated, and it'll be tucked away at the end of the album. Anyway, this is a collab with Method Man and three other guys who weren't even credited originally and I can't find out anything about. Simmons, is this guy related to Run? I, I don't know. How the hell you think we live in? How you think it feel to be a Simmons? Imagine Christmas and Thanksgiving. The verses from Run and Method Man are fine, but the verse from DMC did catch my notice because I'm, I'm sorry, something about it just does not sound right. Like Run is trying so hard to update his sound. D sounds like he hasn't changed a thing since 1988. This is the first sign of problems. Run, as it turns out, was all about staying relevant with new styles. DMC had other plans. DMC seems like such a badass on stage, but in real life he's like a quiet, introverted guy, and he'd been letting Run, who's kind of a loud, stubborn guy, call all the shots. However, in the mid-90s, after shouting at the top of his range for 10 years, D came down with an incurable throat condition that left him unable to raise his voice very high. This would require a complete change in their sound. But DMC was also looking to change his sound anyway. They gotta realize it's not only D don't sound the same, he's not the same. As far as I can tell, DMC thinks that hip hop peaked with Public Enemy and he was just not really into the new stuff. In his memoir, D writes about playing the VMAs with Kid Rock, finally getting back on the MTV stage, surrounded with the flavors of the moment and just being over it. 
He writes that these award shows never really honor the true geniuses whose work stands the test of time, like Bob Dylan, Sheryl Crow, or Eric Clapton. I just want us to stop and reflect on how immediately I, in 2023, would be canceled if I said, why were people listening to Britney Spears instead of talented artists like Eric Clapton? But that's where DMC's head was. His vision of the album was something more like what Everlast, the former rapper from House of Pain, was doing in the late 90s, mixing hip hop with folk and blues. And I also think he thought it would fit his diminished vocal range better. How would this work? Well, wait and see. So let's skip ahead three years to the album's actual release and check out the first two songs, which were definitely part of Run's vision for the album. And I'll say this, I don't think this album gets off to a terrible start. Come to the show that I rock and the flow that I drop, y'all know Run killed the mind. Can't forget about the old that I got and the road to the spot, y'all know I'm skilled to ride. First we have the big hype intro. Jermaine Dupri hypes up the living legends Run DMC and Run raps about how he's a legend who started hip hop and ruled the world in the mid 80s. Hey man, let me let y'all know something. The first rap group to get on MTV. Hard heavy, you heard me? And then Curiously, no DMC on this one. Secondly, we have Queen's Day, a collaboration between three of the great rappers from Queens Run, Nas, and Prodigy from Mob Deep. Nas and Prodigy rap about growing up in Queens. A lot of cash made on Hollis Ave, fast to change, high rollers was living. Run raps about how he's a legend who started hip hop and ruled the world in the mid 80s. More legendary than me, that's what I thought. And if somebody wanna test mine, then watch this. Peter Piper picked Pepper. But Run Rock Rhymes! See, I knew you knew the next line, and I bet you said it. It's been a minute. <laughs> okay, for my money, it's the best song on the album. But again, no DMC on this one. Where's D? We're two songs in and he hasn't shown up. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. He finally shows up on the third song, the title track Crown Royal. Run raps about how he's a legend who started hip hop and ruled the world in the mid 80s. Your video's number one and that was part of our plan. Went from rock box to a whole countdown jam. Took rock music, switched it and flipped it and made it roar. Anywhere you played, we played it before in 80. Mm-hmm, starting to get old. But D raps about... Actually, he doesn't really rap. He just does the hook. Are, are these even words? The King Zarula? And an annoying thing with basically all Run DMC albums since the 90s is that they were constantly using the words king or rock. Still headlining, I'm the king. This album is no exception. But why doesn't DMC have any verses? This is weird, right? Was he really that checked out that he could only contribute a couple words? Well, we'll get to his songs in a second. But now we get to the third vision for this album. And it is not from their third member, Jam Master J, who was pretty on board with Run. Instead, the third vision comes from their boss. Clive Davis's vision for the album was basically the same one he gave Santana. Load the album with guest stars. And as you can tell by the huge number of features we've already had, Run was pretty down with that. But Clive listened to the first draft and he said, I cannot sell a Run DMC album that's purely hip hop. I need you to go back and make it more rock. And what the boss says goes. And so was brought in the man, the myth, the legend. All right, partner. Keep on rolling, baby. You know what time it is. Limp Biscuit frontman Fred Durst appears on the song Them Girls. Them girls, them girls, them girls I do adore. I like a sweet and a genuine divine, all kinds I love them all. Them girls. No, that's not a Jay Z sample. It comes from an old school rap song that Fred actually got to before Jay Z would. Girls more you know. I like the small girls, I like the tall girls, I like all the girls, but the nerdy call girls. So okay, it's easy to clown on Fred Durst now, but you have to understand this is the early 2000s, when it was even easier to clown on Fred Durst. Like, he's a cuddly old man now, people actually seem to like him more these days, but even when he was big, he was always kind of embarrassing. The thing about Run DMC is that they always demanded respect. And Fred Durst was just so easy to disrespect. Run DMC were teenagers when they started, but they were already men. 
and Fred Durst is a boy. So this team up makes no sense. In the Run DMC biography, Raising Hell, which is where I'm getting a lot of this information from, Ad Rock from the Beastie Boys talks about how he made the beat for this song and then took his name off of it when he found out Fred Durst would be the feature. Yeah, okay, the thought of Limp Biscuit sex toys is too horrifying for words. I don't want to hear Fred Durst rap about banging chicks. And honestly, I don't want to hear Run DMC rap about it either. Although I guess I got my wish because, you know, since Run had found Jesus and was now Reverend Run and everything, he doesn't. If you're too godly to rap about this kind of thing, Rev, then don't. not edited this song one bit. And of course, if we're going to go rap rock, then we gotta bring in the guy who brought Run DMC back into the conversation. If Run DMC and Aerosmith had a baby, his name would be Kid Rock. So the other track is called The School of Old by the American Badass himself. Yeah, Kid Rock has so much of this song that it's basically his song, and Run DMC is the feature. Like, it's a Kid Rock song, with a verse from Run about how he's a legend who started hip-hop and ruled the world in the mid-80s. Okay, I realize we're all hearing this 20 years later, and Kid Rock's presence puts the stink of unwashed scrotum all over this. But purely on a commercial level, I think Clyde's instincts were correct. Around the turn of the millennium, Run DMC's classic stuff had more in common with rap metal than it did with modern hip hop. I remember Kid Rock pulling out Run DMC at the VMAs. I thought that shit was super cool. I think Kid Rock's fans were more likely to buy a Run DMC album than Jay-Z's. So either of these songs would have worked as singles. But Y2K came and went without either of these songs or the album coming out, and the reason why is that neither Fred Durst nor Kid Rock's managers would let it happen. According to the Raising Hell biography, even Durst was confused. Like, what? But I'm the vice president of my own label. What do you mean my manager won't let you use the record? It took a full year to get it all done. And even then, none of these songs wound up as the single. Perhaps Fred Durst and Kid Rock's people were trying to keep them from getting overexposed. That happens sometimes. Or maybe their management realized that they should keep their distance because they sensed a massive bomb in the making. Because I don't know if you noticed from the clips I played, but have you noticed something missing? Where's D? Where's D? Where's D? Where's D? Where's D? Yeah, where's D? Where's DMC? Where's Daryl? D laid his vocals on the songs he liked, and some songs he just wasn't inspired to, to, to rap on. Okay, pretty much everyone acknowledged that DMC had decided to step back a little. Now, in one of the pre-release interviews, Jam Master Jay said, D is not as vocal as usual. He's there, though. His vibe is there, enough to make it ill. All right, yes, he's obviously not doing as much as he used to, but he's got the vibe, right? So fine. Why don't we finally, finally get to one of DMC's tracks? Here is what D recorded for the album. Nothing! I was lying the entire time. He did not record a word. D laid his vocals on the songs he liked. Yeah, he only rapped on the songs he liked, which was none of them. DMC saw the whole thing as a soulless, artless cash grab, and he was not interested in it whatsoever. He wanted to make his folk rap album, and Run wasn't interested in his ideas either, so D just straight walked out. Run and Jay kept working on the album, assuming he would come around, but he never did. So D recorded literally nothing. Call this record the Minnesota Vikings, because it has no D whatsoever. But Todd, you've played us songs with him on it. I heard him. Well, guess what? He didn't record that for this album. I mean, I'm not 100% sure on this because everyone was lying so much about D's involvement, but I'm pretty confident that every time you hear his voice, that's a sample from the 80s. That's why his one verse sounds so out of date. 
They straight up Carrie Fisher in Rise of Skywalkered him into this record, and they had so little to work with that they could only do it for a couple songs. This doomed the album immediately before it even came out. Run DMC was not two separate guys, it was a group. Most rap groups, the way it works is one guy does his verse, then the next guy does his, but Run DMC did not operate like that. They would trade rhymes, finish each other's lines, they played off each other. You remove one of them and you don't have Run DMC. You don't even have half of Run DMC. You have nothing. You can hear at the end of lines where Run should be handing the mic off to Daryl, but instead there's no one there. It sounds like that old sketch where the pips perform without Gladys Knight. <laughs> and so here we are. It is now 2001. The album's been delayed for two years. DMC can't rap. They had to beg him just to let them use the name, but it is finally coming out. And here is how Run DMC meets the new metal moment. Not with Fred Durst. Not with Kid Rock. They have gone through their list of contacts and finally found a guy willing to be seen with them in public. Ladies and gentlemen, the lead single, Rock Show, featuring... I wish you would step back from that ledge, my friend. You could cut ties with all... I have no idea how to evaluate this song. I just can't focus on anything except that their big feature was Stephen Jenkins from Third Eye Blind. Just the rock show, rocking it up. I'm from Third Eye Blind, rock and roll. Look, I love Third Eye Blind. I can sing every word of Semi Charm Life with my eyes closed. But if you're trying to get your new metal on, this is not the guy. Third Eye Blind were not cool. They were a pop rock act your mom could listen to. And they were not even an especially popular mom rock band. After an underwhelming second album, they were rapidly cooling off. Run DMC had to have been turned down by 50 other guys first because no one knew or cared who this guy was. Like here they are being introduced at a halftime show appearance. And coming up, recording stars Jam Master J and Run of Run DMC plus Stephen Jenkins of Third Blind Eye will perform as the Nasdaq. See? No one cares. And it's even worse that they have DMC there just clearly not wanting to be. And they couldn't even think of a way to hide how little he has to do. He's just standing there. Yep, not rapping today. today I don't feel like doing anything. And Run starts quoting It Takes Two by Rob Bass. I wanna rock right now. DJ Run and I'm claiming my crown. I be internationally known. Even got chrome on my microphone. That's so cheap. That's Black Eyed Peas shit. It's not even the worst idea for a feature on the album. They got Third Eye Blind, they also got Sugar Ray. Every morning there's a halo hanging from the corner of I guarantee we were this close to a Smash Mouth feature. Yo, somebody once told me! Sugar Ray and Run DMC! The Sugar Ray song, by the way, was a straight up remake of an old Run DMC song. and their managers also wouldn't clear it as a single. Just pie in the face after another, which probably explains how we wound up with the semi-charmed life guy. I don't know, I guess Rob Thomas didn't make sense for Santana either, and that worked. But this sure doesn't. Third Eye Blind didn't write metal songs for a reason. End, it's, just a rock show. it's just a rock show. What kind of hook is that? Both rock and rap stations obviously rejected this completely, so they tried a different tack with their second single. This is a collaboration with the R&B group Jagged Edge called Let's Stay Together, parentheses, Together Forever, and it's a love song of sorts. It samples Let's Stay Together by Al Green, and Run does a verse about how him and DMC should stay rapping together forever. Been down since day one, and no matter where I go, people want to see you next to me. They say, what's up with D? Yeah, that seems a little manipulative to me. It's like buying your wife jewelry when you're already in the doghouse. Daryl was not impressed. Why 
can't touch my love for my wife, baby, I ain't going nowhere. And the second verse is to his wife, which I think it's weird to dedicate one verse to a rap partner and the other to your wife. Anyway, this at least gives D something to do in the video and look not so much like a non-participant, even though that's basically what he is. It's a song where the sample is doing most of the work, and that song flopped too. And so we come to the end of the road. The label was preparing a third single. They ended up just cutting their losses. But I have saved it for you for last. Remember how good Walk This Way was? Well, why don't we do another rock cover? Take the Money and Run is a classic rock staple from the Steve Miller Band, and it infamously has some of the worst rhymes ever written, particularly in the second verse where he rhymes Texas, Facts is, Justice, and Taxes. Run has apparently taken the spirit of the song to heart. Let me tell you about what I love in Gina. Love like no other couldn't get in between them. Always stay fly, man, I wish that you'd seen them. Said they had a ski, but nobody believed them. This is humiliating. But I had Gina moved to Pensacola. Woody got a rolly and a Motorola. It's just painful to hear him doing these super goofy rhymes. You're the kings of rock. You invented rhyming. These sound like the lyrics that Anthony Kiedis threw out. Oh, and the feature here is Everlast, who showed up to sing one line over and over again. And boy, this is not in his range. He's a gruff blues singer. This is a pop song. It's a fun, goofy little 70s pop song. You should have gotten the third eye blind guy for this. The Run DMC album with no DMC on it had been getting bad buzz for two years, so by the time it dropped, both critics and fans tore it to shreds. By that point, Clive Davis was long gone from Arista Records, possibly because he spent $12 million on a broken band. But could this album have ever been a success? Maybe commercially, if they had gotten DMC to record something. But could it have been good? Probably not. Even if DMC had wanted to do the classic style, he couldn't anymore. Maybe they could have split it, speaker box, Love Below style, but even then, you've got one half that's a glorified tribute album, and the other half that's... Well, Daryl did eventually drop that solo album, and you can hear what that would have been like. But I think about my life and everything is okay. I gotta pave a way to a brighter day. Cause it's really plain and simple when it came to me. There's a lot of people just like me. I'm the cats in the play and the this is a tiny bit whack. Ron and DMC made a kind of reconciliation and talked about making a real record this time, but when Jam Master J was murdered the year after, that pretty much ended that. The duo still toured for the next two decades until their last show last year, but functionally the band was over. And that's a real shame. These guys are legends, and they deserve to go out on a better note than this. Crown Royal is a trend-riding failure that completely misunderstood why the band was ever successful, and it will go down in history as one of hip-hop's great flaming disasters. It's like that, and that's the way it is. Peace. Well, that was fun. And if you want some content about a long-delayed project from the early 2000s that was actually good, my friend Lindsay Ellis has made a video about how they finally adapted Lord of the Rings to a watchable series of movies. And you can watch that exclusively on Nebula, a creator-specific platform where you can watch great videos from other creators like H Bomber Guy, Adam Neely, and myself. And now if you sign up with my link, you get free access to Nebula Classes, where our creators host classes on how to be a creator. You will not only get access to all of the great stuff Nebula offers, plus classes, but you will get it for a little over $2.50 a month. And you'd also be directly supporting me, which, you know, I'd appreciate it. So click the link in the description and check it out below. Thank you for listening, and good night.